Hello everyone and welcome to the Cambridge Creatives Q&A with Rienkia Atto. I'm Ellie. Hi and I'm Hannah and we're the founders of Cambridge Creatives. We're a student-run creative collective curating a series of talks with world-renowned professionals in film, TV and theatre. So please follow our Facebook page to find out more about future events. Just a couple of housekeeping rules before we begin. If you have any questions for our guest speaker, please type them in the Q&A function, which is somewhere down there and not the chat function, and we'll read them out for you. One, bear with us if there are any technical difficulties and two, let us know in the chat if there are any problems hearing or seeing us. And most importantly, enjoy the Q&A. So just as a quick introduction to our guest today, Rienke is an acclaimed producer who most recently co-produced the television series Noughts and Crosses, which premiered on BBC this year. She founded her own production company called So and So Productions in 2012, which has since produced films which have screened at widely recognised festivals around the world, including Sundance, London Film Festival and the LA Film Festival. We are honoured to have this innovative sp producer speak. So my first question for you is, what did, when did you know that you wanted to be a producer or work in film and television? Okay, so, all right, so basically, I mean, I grew up with a mother, I come from quite a creative family, so um, my grandmother was a trapeze artist um, and a ballet dancer, and she worked in the circus, and my granddad, and she's Dutch, um, she was Dutch, she's no longer here, and my granddad, he was a, a fire blower and a tap dancer, and so they met at the circus, so that's one side of the family. Um, and so I've come from creativity and, and my granddad eventually was also a photographer and so was my grandmother. Um, and she later on had a ballet school. She, she learned ballet and she, 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 um, she had a ballet school in Ghana. Um, and so my mum grew up with this. And so I actually gained interest in film through my mum. And she did a film course quite late in life. Um, and she used to come home with films and she used to just dump them and say, okay, watch that and write about it. So I think the combination of the journalism and the, the love of film started there really. And I was about eight years old. So I'd write these essays about, you know, some obscure films sometimes. Um, and then, you know, I'd show them to my mom and we'll discuss it. So the, the love really began there, you know, and I think, she was quite obsessed with certain films that were on rotation at home. Um, the Godfather was one of them. Um, and so uh, we grew up with, with film at home, but it wasn't really until my years as a journalist, um, uh, I was a broadcast journalist, but I sort of moved into production, um, producing, I produced news, um, TV news, but also radio. And it wasn't actually until a long stint on radio when I was producing that I realized that actually, um, I actually want to take this, this skill set further. Um, and then I started applying to film courses and everyone, I think um, people say there was a London film school and then there was um, the National Film and Television School. And so I think I orig originally applied for the London Film School um, and then I went there and I thought, okay, no, this isn't actually for me because they're not, it's not specific enough and I wanted to, to really train as a journal, um, as a producer. So then I applied to the NFTS um, and I was like, okay, okay, this place is, this is for me. Um, so yeah, it, the love or the interest began um, as I was working in radio as a producer, but I think the actual film and after all the films that I've seen in my life, I've seen so many, it was actually Christopher Nolan's um, Inception that actually just it, when I came out of the cinema, I think I actually went to see it with my mum and my brothers. We're, all, we're quite close and we're all lovers of film. And so I came out of the cinema and I was like, right, mum, that's it. I'm going to be a producer. She was like, are you sure? You know, I was like, yes, that's it. She was like, okay. Um, and so ever since then, I was like, okay, so how's going to do it? And then I applied and then I got in and the rest is history. That's yeah. an amazing, amazing story. <laughs> what a family to come from. <laughs> Quite, yeah, it's quite, and then we're all quite creative. And so, and I think we all have a love of, of a real interest um, uh, for film and a love of film. So that helped too. Um, it felt natural for, for me to have this. And my mom was actually a documentary filmmaker. Wow. So, but the thing is she had, she made one documentary. Um, and I think at the time it was a bit challenging for her. Um, and so she she didn't really pursue it and she was really talented but she couldn't pursue it because there's four of us um 
and and it you know at the time it wasn't it didn't seem like um, a sustainable um, source of uh, employment so yeah she gave up so it's like she kind of handed the baton over to me without really knowing it yeah. and were you ever involved in film while you were at university before you went to specific um, film school um no I wasn't actually um I've always sort of, I think I've always had a personal interest but I never got involved in any sort of film societies or anything like that I was at Goldsmiths um, in London and I know I didn't which is it's funny isn't it but I think I got all the, the film knowledge and it came from home so maybe I thought I didn't actually need it um, but, um, but yeah no I, I didn't and when you came out of film school what was your first job how was your sort of transition into the industry so um, out of film school, it's interesting actually because out of film school, while I was still at film school, I was working on my first feature with director, the director and writer Shola Amu. Um, and so we were working on our first feature because we thought, look, you know, um, we haven't got any time to waste. I already, when I went to film school, I was like 31. And so I come from a professional, you know, a career and, um, and uh, we didn't have any time to lose. So we really wanted to give ourselves a head start. So we, we, we knew that we had to make a first feature um, shortly coming out of, of film school. So um, we were developing it during film school. And so the first job I had, actually, I was juggling production on a moving image, which was the name of the film, it was about gentrification in South London. And then I was working for a company um, called Acme on a project developing um, BAME writing talent. I don't like the term BAME, so it's say people of color. Um, and so it was, it was a collaboration between Channel 4 and uh, screens, Screen Skills. They used to be called Creative Skillset before. Um, and so through that, I met so many amazingly talented um, writers and directors. So that was the first job I had. Um, and um, so, yeah, that was the first job. And then actually, no, it wasn't. That was the second job. The first job I had was actually connected to my Prince William scholarship that I got with BAFTA. So I got work for a few months with a company called Headstrong, which was a drama company, TV company, um, owned by Warner Brothers. So I worked there for a few months and then I went to work with Acme in this project. Sounds amazing. Could you tell us a bit more about the Prince William scholarship, what exactly it entails? Because you were the inaugural recipient of it, I think. Yeah, there was me and, and two other very talented guys, both called Sam. Um, um, and so basically what it, what it gave me was uh, £10,000 to help with my fees for the second year at the NFTS. And I got two mentors. I got one from Warner Brothers, an amazing guy called Chris Law. And I got a mentor through BAFTA. And so my mentor was Christine Langan, who at the time headed up BBC Films and who's now baby cow. Um, so, I mean, if you, you can imagine, I think at the time to be associated with Warner Brothers, Christopher Nolan, Inception, um, and BAFTA, who, you know, it was, it was quite amazing to be associated with such, such big um, champions mm -hmm. um, and people, you know, people, people that, you know, organizations that you trust you trust their judgment and you trust the films that they make because they're so good at what they do. Um, so yeah, it was, it was, it was brilliant. And Prince William as well um, to be a part of that. So it was, it was great. And I think what I, what, it, what it enabled me to do is obviously the fees, you get great mentoring. Um, but then you also get exposed to these fantastic masterclasses for some of the, the greats that you admire and respect. And it's, it's a learning. It's a constant learning. Um, and I guess you're building these relationships with these, these, these companies. Um, so that now as a producer, I send things to Warner Brothers, um, BAFTA, you know, I'm a, I'm a BAFTA member. Um, but it's just nice having these people championing you in your career and supporting you from the very beginning of your career. So yeah, it was, it was great. It was really, really good to be a part yeah, of that. Yeah, amazing. One of the first, yeah. Yeah, quite the dream team. <laughs> um, <laughs> Do you have any advice that you would give to students or other young people who would be following in your footsteps? 
I don't know if many students or lovers of film know that they can actually enter this industry. I don't think it's always that. It's, it's not always been accessible, um, you know, and I think coming from certain backgrounds, you know, filmmaking isn't seen as a career. You know, it's you're not a doctor, you're not a lawyer, you're not saving people's lives. What are you doing? It's like, is that a serious career to have? Um, but I think what people need to realize is that it is. It's a really important, it's quite lucrative. Um, it's a massive industry um, and it's a creative industry and anyone can be part of it. So you should, if it's something you want to do, you should go for it um, and not hold yourself back because it, it, it is, and then they need you. They need you to come in and like, and, and, and tell stories that we don't get to see. So I'd say, don't think that, you know, you can't be a part of it. I mean, anyone can, you know, and it's, it's made up of, of, of honest people who are, who are great storytellers. You have to love stories. And I think if you love stories and you want to put yourself out there, because sometimes you have to dig deep within and to share something of yourself to make something come alive, you know, whether that's a film script or a TV series, or a radio show. You have to give a piece of yourself, I think, as a producer um, to, to make it feel real and tangible, like real and connected. People have to feel like they, the, the stories resonate with them. Um, so my advice is um, go for it. You might not, it's not, you don't jump. It's a gradual process. Um, you have to work your way up. So don't be frustrated by the process. Just enjoy that journey um, and, and it is an enjoyable journey. You learn so much about yourself as well, you know, so, um, that would be my advice. Thank you. It's amazing yeah. advice. Great advice. Um, speaking about those sort of like conventional careers, is that why you went into journalism or was it because of this, this passion that you were talking about? Um, and how similar is the, you were producing TV sort of journalism? How similar is that to, to the producing you're doing now? Um, I think the, the appeal for me is because I always, I always, actually the first career I wanted to do is I wanted to be a journalist and then the filmmaking came a bit later on. It's like, I didn't, I didn't fully know. I knew that I loved this world, but I didn't know what I would do in it. You know, because mm -hmm. growing up, all you know about is directors or actors. You don't really think about all the other people who make these films possible. So I didn't know. I didn't know that I had to understand and learn what I could give and what, what excited me. But I think most importantly, it was storytelling, the, the, the stories, having an eye for stories and knowing where to go to find them, how to make them come alive. Um, and a big passion for me is developing stories. So creating things from, the, from nothing, you know. Um, so how, how similar is it? Um, storytelling, it comes in many forms, but news sometimes can be very formulaic. Um, sometimes news can be quite depressing because, you know, when you're working in the industry, it's like bad news is good news. Um, that's just how it works. Um, but obviously within that, there are some lovely stories that you can tell. Um, and I always wanted to be a part of the good positive stories, you know, um, and there are so many stories to celebrate, but sometimes we get caught up in this cycle of bad news, you know, like now everything's about COVID and, you know, what about all the amazing things that are happening, you know, um, finding those other stories to balance, you know, the sort of doom and gloom. Um, there are similarities, I guess, why I love um, uh, film and TV and creating stories is that you can take the knowledge and the understanding of those stories and make something out of that. So you can start stories based on truth and then you can go wild with it if you want to, or you can keep it grounded. So you have a choice when you're creating stories for um, TV um, and film. Um, and then I guess obviously there is in documentary and TV news, there's obviously a realness, they're true stories. So you have to be really cautious about how you're representing um, those, those, those stories. Um, and I guess you do have a responsibility also when you're, when you're developing stories, they have to come, um, they have to come from a true place, as I said, I was saying before, and people have to connect. Um, so, so yeah, there are similarities, but there are also major differences, you know, mm -hmm. it's factual. So whatever you're, 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 
you're going out to show has to be factual. You can't create anything really. Yeah. Do you feel like the, the skills you learned in TV journalism and your MA in journalism prepared you for producing sort of fictional long form content? Like, I guess, structuring these long stories or? Yeah. I'd say, yeah, I think every, I think anything that you do, and I guess they are quite connected. Um, it's media, isn't it? It's all media, you know, um, it is connected and it, it, it did, it really did actually, it did, um, it did help the, the way you craft stories, you know, how does a story begin? How does it end? What's in the middle? Um, it does, it does help you with the discipline. Um, but I guess going to film school, um, it's not only the storytelling that I, I wanted to learn about, it was about the business, the show business. It's, um, it's, um, it is quite a different, it's a different world, you know. Um, there are some incredible characters you meet and um, it's, it's all about, you know, producing, producers are pretty much, they run and manage production. So you, you have to, you have to learn loads about scheduling and, budgets and distribution and you know if you're making something okay how are you going to sell it where who are you selling it to which audiences are you connecting to um and you know who who yeah who is your audience so um you do learn that also in in journalism so yeah it did it did help i guess mm. yeah, yeah i guess both the world of journalism and film are very high intensity and, and quite yeah it can be um it can be and i guess what happens, what I guess the greatest thing I learned from working in the newsroom, you know, when a news story breaks, um, if you're going, ah, you're going mad, um, you're not going to be able to focus, right? And, and sometimes something breaks and you have to be really calm in order to focus and know what you're doing and make sure things are right and the facts are checked. And so in filmmaking, if anything goes wrong, I stay absolutely calm. I'm not going to go wild. You have to remain calm so that you can make the right decisions and make sure that you're supporting everyone the way they need to be supported and things go wrong. So how are you going to react to those, those problems that arise? You know, you've got to keep a level headed. So that's what the journalism taught me as well, working in newsrooms and breaking stories. Do you have like a, a favorite memory of your time in journalism? Like one of the stories that you sort of empowered or to be broadcast or like a moment um, that sums it up for you? There are so many moments. Oh gosh. Um, I guess one of the stories, I guess this is a good memory for me because it was one of the stories that I first broke when I started in at BBC, um, BBC Southwest, because I'm a Londoner, but I went to work in Devon. Um, and it was a story about a man who bought a zoo, basically. Um, and saved all these animals who were who were being threatened with, you know, being put down. Um, and so I thought, you know, I, I, I remember going up to that park um, in Sparkwell, Dartmoor Zoo, Zoological Park, and um, covering that story. Um, and obviously it stays, you know, it stays quite close to me because it was one of the main, the, the stories that got onto the BBC. And it was also my MA because I was still studying and that was the first things I did when I was working at the BBC. Um, and we remained friends. And then obviously that story eventually became a film um, with uh, Matt Damon. I had nothing to do with it, but the story of the man, Benjamin Me, became a, um, a film with Matt Damon. So we bought a zoo and Scarlett Johansson. So that was great. So that would always be a, a nice memory for me. Yeah. yeah it was, and, then, and obviously there were some amazing animals in that zoo. He had lions and tigers and bears and you know and he had great visions and and wanted to do so much for that park to keep those animals alive so yeah that was incredible awesome. <laughs> um just to come to producing as a profession how would you describe what it is you actually do and could you run us through sort of a, a day in the life possibly pre-corona and maybe during corona god corona yeah uh Okay, well, I mean, there's different types of producing because obviously there's producing in development mode or there's producing if you're on a production at the time. So um, I'll give you a bit of a, okay. So as an independent producer, 
I might be juggling a number of different projects at a time. Um, and so I guess I give an example of what I'm doing at the moment. So I am developing a number of projects. Um, so when I say developing, I am working with writers and or directors to create the stories and make sure their scripts are ready to go into production. Um, so I'm balancing some of them, those projects, there's a couple. And there's another project that I am trying to attach cast for or attach cast to. Um, and there's a couple of projects that I'm prepping to go into production as well producers um, and so that means that I might spend the morning part of my day talking to a writer about um, how we can further develop this story to make sure that it's ready to go into production to make sure that the financiers are happy um, and then I might take another call with a director who's like really wanting like the script's ready and he's like okay well what like what's happening now what are we doing and I'm like okay well We've approached a cast member waiting for their agent to come back to us to let us know if they're attached or not. And then once they're attached, we can then finalize the finance plan, potentially. Um, so there's that. And then prepping a project might mean so the script is ready. There's money to, be, to, to make the project. So now we're finding um, the HODs, the head of departments, to attach to the project. Um, we're still looking for cars to attach to the project. Um, we're finding locations um, and we've decided on dates. And so we know when we're shooting. So we're basically planning and prepping to meet the dates when we go into production. So that is at the moment what's happening. So those are all mainly film projects. Um, if I'm working in production, um, what I would do, what I would start the day, I'll get up. I will have a meeting, um, um, have a shower, of course, and then um, go to set where I will meet the director, the DOP, and we'll sort of talk about this, the shots for the day. Um, we would have had uh, a call sheet and we would have had the sides of the script so we know what we're shooting and we will run through that. Then I'll probably go to the departments, all the heads of departments, check if they're okay, check in on the actors, um, and then we will prepare to, to take basically um, shoot the first scene of the day. And so I'll be there with the director. Um, and then you'll be on set for like some 12 hour days. And, and then you, you do, do all the shots and then you go home. And so that's it. So you're on production. That could be if it's a film, sometimes it's like four weeks or six weeks. Depends if it's, if it's a feature. Shorts are probably a week if that. Um, and, and series like Lots of Crosses was, um, how long? That was uh, two blocks. Um, and that was many more weeks. Or how many weeks was that? Can't remember right now. Um, hopefully it'll come back to me. But yeah, it's a longer period of time because there's so much that you have to shoot. Yeah. Amazing. So busy all the time. Yeah, it, it really, it really is busy. You have so many things that you're juggling. And this is the thing as a producer. Um, and as an independent, so I've come from an independent background, you have to juggle num a number of different projects because you can't put all your eggs in one basket. Because if that doesn't, if nothing happens in that basket, then you're kind of, it's not very looking very good for you. So you have to, um, you have to be, you have to find projects, you have to be developing projects, you have to find projects that you can jump on, you have to find ways to make money um, and sustain yourself, you know. Um, and I think, you know, if you're working in film, film takes a long time um, sometimes to, to, to finance. Um, so you, 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 if you might be waiting sometimes there's some years, I think the favorite took like 10 years to make. Um, films take a while. So if you're a film producer, or if you haven't sort of, you're not diversifying between, or, you know, um, moving between film and TV, you, you would have to find something else to do um, while you're developing the projects. You know? And with, 
sorry with yeah. regards to choosing um your projects you produce dear mr shakespeare and the moving image which are both films which focus on and deal with issues of race and ethnicity do you feel a responsibility in choosing which projects to produce and which kind of stories to broadcast yeah i think for me it's very important that i am telling stories that i care about um and i that i feel need some attention um you know, with, uh, with a moving image that was all about gentrification in South London. I grew up in Brixton and Brixton has changed so much since I was a kid. So that story is very personal to me. And actually it was loosely based on my experiences, um, you know, growing up in Brixton and then leaving um, for a few years. Um, and I mean, my mom my mom's sold up. Um, now it's where the house that she sold is worth so much, probably close to a million, but anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, she sold up and we went, she moved to, um, we moved to a nearby Crystal Palace. Um, so I left the area and then, um, and then every time I came back, I felt like the natives were looking at me like I was an outsider. And I thought, well, hold on a second. I spent my formative years here. I have a right to this place. It's where I grew up. And it's personal to me. So I felt, I felt, I felt actually violated. So that story about someone coming back and trying to be a part of the community, it was very close and real for us. And also for, for Shola who grew up in Elephant and Castle. And obviously there are major changes taking place in all around London. You almost feel like the people who made the communities are being pushed out. And so for us, we were like, no, we have to say something. We have to document what's happening now. And so it was so important for us to do that then. I mean, Brixton has changed, Elephant and Castle has changed so much since we made those films, that film. Um, and yeah, so similarly with Dear Mr. Shakespeare, um, yeah, issues surrounding immigration. Um, you know, it's there, my, my, my dad is an immigrant, my mum's an immigrant. Well, she was born in, in sorry, but she's of Dutch Ghanaian heritage. So not many people actually from here. Um, but we are also part of, we make up part of this society, we make up part of this country and we are British. And so, yeah, it's, it's important that I represent um, my connection to the, to, to the land, but also um, the stories that matter to me um, and that are important to me. And that was, you know, so yeah, and everything I'm making, I'm trying to, it's, I guess it's a little piece of me. I guess there are projects that might come to me that I um that that you know might not be connected. And I guess this is this is where it, it can be quite challenging for a producer if you are broke, and something comes to you and it might not be a hundred percent what you might what might what you might want to do. Um, you have to decide whether you're going to okay just make it as it's just a piece of work. You know it can sustain you for a bit, and then you can focus on your other things. Um, you can do that, but I haven't. I haven't had that yet. I've been quite lucky. Everything that I've made, I've enjoyed making and I made it for the right reasons, you know. Um, Noughts and Crosses, it's about interracial relationship, it's about love. Um, I, you know, I come from a mixed background. Um, that story is interesting to me. Um, yeah, would I take something that doesn't resonate with me at this stage? I don't think so, because working on projects takes a long time. And like I said before, you're given a piece of yourself. So I, I think it, I always want to make things that people can look at and say, oh, okay, I know that. Oh, that makes sense. You know, Rinky made that. Okay, yeah. So it's, it's important, I feel. Definitely. I mean, all those projects are incredibly powerful. Um, a moving image has been described as a film that Spike Lee might have made about Brixton. Do you have any... I know you've spoken about Christopher Nolan as well. Do you have any... <laughs> like influences on you or like people whose footsteps you would want to follow in? Yeah, I mean, Spike Lee has made some really, again, Spike Lee was one of the filmmakers that my mom used to come home and give me the videotapes for VHS, back in the day it was VHS. She would say, look, watch this. And so yeah, do the right thing, amazing film. Um, there are some, <laughs> I guess obviously uh, Martin Scorsese, these are old, you know, these are all the old cats who, I guess, pr quite predictable, but they're good storytellers. Mm -hmm. um, Francis Ford Coppola. Um, uh, gosh, and there's so many. It's like when you're asked this, it's like, oh, God, I, I don't know film anymore. I can't think. Um, there's who else? There's so many. Now, why isn't coming to me? 
Um, oh, no pressure. <laughs> oh, yeah, sorry. I always get this. People ask me this question all the time. It's like, okay, what is your knowledge of film, actually, if you can't think? There are, there are so many, but now it's just, they're just, they're just not there. Um, there are loads. Mm-hmm. Um, but they'll probably come to me later and I'll say, hold on a second, I've got it, I've got it, I'll tell you. But yeah, but those are some of the greats who have influenced me. Um, and I, those are the people, I can watch their movies over and over and over and over again. And there's, I can't find fault mm. in, their, in their filmmaking. Um, you know, I think we're quite spoilt now. There's so much, you're being bombarded with so much. There's not only films, there's, there's you know, all, you know, Netflix and Apple TV and Amazon. And there are so, so many, you know, so many filmmakers. Um, Derek Siam France, France. Um, Blue Valentine, you see Blue Valentine? No? Yeah. Um, you, yeah, he's, he's very talented. He's recently made this series with, um, Mark Ruffalo TV series. Yeah. Now the name escapes me, but there, um, there are, there are, um, there are so many. I've gone. Yeah. It's fine. That's a, that's a great list. <laughs> <laughs> Film education. Um, yeah. You were speaking about how sort of the quality of TV nowadays is, is, is so much better. It's on par with film. So moving on to Noughts and Crosses, which was some of the best TV we've had this year. How did you become involved in the project? Um, gosh, yeah. So I, I came on, I think, quite early. I joined, I think it was December, or no, towards the end of 2017. Um, and I was approached by Mammoth um, to work on the project. At the same time as Kibwe Taveras, who was the mind behind you know creating the world he's also an executive producer on the show um so we came on board um i think for us it was about creating a world that felt authentic and real you know a reimagining of our world if colonialism never happened um and so much you know kibwe uh, um, and i and the team we did so much outside also did jamie um Jamie Ramsey, who's a DOP, so much thinking went into behind, like really untangling colonialism. Like, what would the world look like if it hadn't happened, right? So, um, so that was a big part. And, and one of my, my jobs was actually, you know, introducing Yoruba so that the, the crosses spoke a language that, you know, felt true to, to the world um, that we had created. And authentic um, so so yeah that's how I, I came on board really um, and it was it was it was quite an amazing experience because of, of 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 the talent that were working together you know the writers Rachel Delahaye Nathaniel Price Lydia Ditmiji, um Toby it was it was we were just trying to do something different and obviously the book is so everyone loves the book, you know? And I guess that was quite a pressure because um, there's an expectation for the book. They love the book, you know, hoping people love the series because um, it, it is a bit different to the series. Um, but we wanted it to feel um, unique, obviously, because it was, a, it was almost a cinematic. We tried to make it a, a cinematic experience, you know? Um, so yeah, and obviously working in South Africa where, you know, Apartheid only really ended in 1994. It's quite a weird, weird situation to be in, you know, because we flipped the world, and um, you know, the black cast were the important ones, you know, and so, and sometimes there were, you know, there were some. It was, it was a different mindset, you know, for, for even, you know, when we got some of the essays, um, that they weren't, they were in servitude instead of, you know, being. The, the main characters it was it was interesting really an interesting experience and such an amazing crew that we worked with in South amazing crew in South Africa you know really um and and working with such a talented group of actors Jack Rowan, Masali, um, Baduza, Josh Dillon, Jonathan Ajayi, Kiki Bimar they are they were just a delight to work with um but yeah I think 
the, 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 again, like I said to you earlier, development is such, it's, I love development. And so I came on very early to help also with the script and giving ideas to how we can make this a great experience for the viewer. Mm. It really yeah. shows how much thought has been put into everything. Um, yeah, it also sounds like a really collaborative process as well. So you co-produced the series with Rock Nation, which is Jay-Z's company. Mm. What, were some of, what were some of the challenges of working alongside another production company? And was this a kind of a new dynamic that you had to, to work um, on? Yeah, because I'm coming from independent film, so it's a completely different situation. I think when you're working with, when you're working on TV, there's loads of execs um, and everyone has their different ideas, but I didn't have much dealings with Rock Nation. Um, I think the execs had to deal with all of that. Um, we had great access to music, um, the Rock Nation library, um, which was great. We got some great music in that, in the show. Um, but, but yeah, I think, I think the, the only difference yeah, is all these different opinions that you have to sort of surmise and, you know, take everything and just make sure that you're answering to everyone and hoping, hoping that everyone's happy in that process. But luckily I, I was pretty much hands-on and working with pretty much on set. So I didn't have to deal with much of that stuff, you know? Mm. Yeah. Sounds good. What were the, what were some of the most sort of challenging elements, whether um, translating things from the book into the series or bringing things to, to life? Um, I think the most challenging thing is making sure that the, the lovers of the book weren't going to be disappointed with the changes we made. Mm. Um, so I think Jonathan's character of Lacan was, um, that was the big difference. I don't think he, he played a, like, you know, Mercy, um, oh goodness, um, the sort of military school wasn't a big part in the books. And so creating that and hoping that it will connect to, to the lovers of the book. I think that was the biggest challenge and making sure that we created a world that was believable and people connected to. Um, um, and also, you know, it was shot in South Africa and the hope was that South Africa, um, people would see that as what the UK would be, you know. Um, I think sometimes we might have got certain trees like that wouldn't actually appear. I mean, there are actually palm trees in Cornwall, but um, I think just making sure that we made the landscape connect with the UK. Um, that was another thing. I think we, we managed that quite well. Um, yeah, I think that was the biggest challenge. It was like the fans, oh God, we like, we said, we love the book, we cannot wait. I was like, oh gosh, well, we hope, we, we hope we, you love what we've done with the show. Yeah, it must have been really challenging, but yeah, it came across brilliantly. Um, but the series did have an amazing, amazing soundtrack. And mm -hmm. as a producer, are you involved at all with selecting the tracks for the series? And generally, how do you go about, you know, selecting the perfect soundtrack? Um, I wasn't across that mainly. Um, Kibwe was across a lot of that in the beginning. Um, in the beginning, but the final track list, not so much. But um, I think I'm, I'm a big lover of music. Music is important. I used to play the tenor horn. Um, again, like film, it's, quite, it's been quite a musical family and I've got quite an eclectic taste. And so for me, music is very important um, to the cinematic experience. And you don't have to have music all the time. Sometimes you, it's not necessary. You might just need sound effects, just good sound effects, whether it's the, you know, trees rustling or, you know, if it's, uh, some other sort of sound if you're on a tropical climate that makes you associate the sound with the place that's important um but yeah music is i love music you know um i'm eclectic but i i do i think jazz has to be like my favorite type of music my music genre yeah cool um what were some of your favorite memories from shooting on location in south africa south africa has really good food <laughs> has good food it has good wine um the place is beautiful um it's absolutely stunning um i made some fun i made some really very close friends um and working with with people from other countries and understanding how they do things that's always always going to be an amazing lesson um you know and also living in a, a different country and seeing how that world what that world's like and 
um, I guess, how you might appreciate or not appreciate your own home, or where you're from. Um, I guess we're quite privileged um, in, in the UK to a certain degree. Um, so yeah, understanding the dynamics of South Africa, um, that was a big lesson for me. Um, but also learning not to be so judgmental. You're coming from a certain place, you're going to another country. Um, you have to learn that, you know, things are done differently. There's different histories. Um, you sort of should think before you speak and say things. Um, I got, <laughs> sometimes I got, you know, cause you, you come in and, and I never, I never been to South Africa. So you obviously have, you, you, you know, what's happened in history and, so you go in with sometimes a judgment, you go to a place with judging, judgment, and, um, and that, soon, that soon kind of went away. Sometimes things did disturb me because they, they do have some issues, but there's such beauty in the country um, as well. There's so much to celebrate, and it's a fantastic place to work, and I would work there anytime. Yeah, fantastic crews. Some of the most hardworking people I've met. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. How involved were you in casting um, the show? And were there, was there any way in particular that you approached casting? Um, I was involved. Yeah, I was involved from the beginning. Um, any way you approach it. I think we had a casting director um, called Susie, who's amazing. Um, for Noughts and Crosses, this was. Um, yeah, I think how it happens, there's self-tapes. You know, you've got self-tapes that come in then there are particular actors that you might suggest um, and then they'll do self-tapes or you'll see them in person or you'll go through a whole load of self-tapes and then you'll make your sort of finalised crew um, or your list of your top five or whatever um, and then you meet them and then you have to test chemistry as well and so um, it took a long time to find Masali um, who's Sefi and um, uh, when we found her with Jack, because we had already cast Jack Rowan for Callum, when we found her and their chemistry was just like, wow, we could watch these guys forever. It was just, whoa, it was so amazing. And then we were just like, okay, we just knew. Um, but yeah, Jack, they're all super talented. And so um, it was exciting. I think we really knew Jonathan, Kibwe and I were like, okay, yeah, Jonathan, Jay Villacan, um, Josh Dillon, you know, we're like, yeah. So we all sort of decide, or, or, you know, the execs and producer and the director and myself, we were all part of those decisions. Mm -hmm. um, with, with the other films I've worked on, um, sometimes, you know, the director had, might have um, exactly who he wants to cast in his mind. Shola is very much like that. Um, so for a moving image, he pretty much knew who he wanted and, you know, we're good friends and we've got a great working relationships. So I was like, okay, who? All right, let me see. Okay, cool. Yeah, fine. Um, with Pond Life, um, that when I came on to Pond Life, I think we, we would just, it was pretty much cast actually, almost, almost fully cast. Um, and so, so, you know, I, I think it was like, came just towards the end when they were, they were just finalizing some of the cast. But I think Daisy was already part of that. Um, Daisy Edgar Jones. Um, and so who is a darling, absolutely amazing star. Um, and yeah, and Tom, yeah. So they were all part of it. And, and I just saw the head, cause I came in quite late. And I, I saw them, I was like, great, they look fantastic. And they were, they were great, wonderful, wonderful um, to work with. So, so yeah, it depends also as a producer, what, when you come on, are you coming on as a producer for hire? Are you developing the project from the ground up? At which stage, you know? Um, and sometimes you, things might have already been set up and you're just coming in to do the job. And so um, Pond Life was a bit like that. I came in quite late um, and to produce with, um, with Dominic and, and Alexandra. Was that part of your decision to sort of set up your own production company to give yourself more freedom to choose which um, productions to develop and also to be on the production from the very beginning? Um, yeah, 
yeah, I think for me, I always wanted to, um, to make the decisions in the projects that I chose to, to, um, to develop. Um, the talent who I wanted to work with. So it just gives me the power to make all those decisions, you know, without having to ask any questions and to tell the stories I want to tell. Um, so it's crucial, but also to protect your IP. Mm. You know, um, it's important to have a space where you can protect yourself um, and all your creative ideas. And so it was important that I did that. Mm. Do you yeah. feel like there's a, a kind of vulnerability about having your own production company and putting your name on the line or is it sort of everything that you wished it to be um yeah i guess i guess that there is you know but you can always collaborate with people you can collaborate with other companies and and we, we're doing so much more of that in the business where two different com companies will come together and 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 make the decisions together um but yeah i guess there is but it's like anything, I think. Um, yeah, there's vulnerability, there's pros and there's cons, you know. Sometimes it's really hard when you're, you're working for a small company. There's so many production companies, like, who are you? Like, what is that? And it takes some time to build up. I'm like, I'm nowhere near the big guns, you know. So, um, but, but what it gives me is, is it protects me, um, you know. So everything I do, I do that through my company. Mm. Yeah. Cool. Um, going forward, is there a, a type of content, a particular type of content that you would like to produce, whether that's sticking in film and TV or would you go into theatre or go back to radio? Um, as a producer, I'm quite greedy, so um, I want to do everything still. And I guess you can as a producer. So, you know, some of the things I've done, uh, documentary, animation, um, I want to do loads more TV, um, film. I would do theatre for sure. Um, there's been some fantastic plays um, that I'd love to because they're just so much more of a an experience, you know, um, and, and I love that, having that experience. So creating that, that's fun. I think anything creative and, and I'm interested in, I would love to do no matter really what it, what it which medium it falls into. Yeah. Um, but I think at the moment, um, I will be doing more TV and there's some film projects again. So that's those, that's probably going to keep me busy for the next couple of years. Yeah. Yeah. It sounds great that you've been able to stay quite busy during this time and have exciting things lined up, but what do you think, do you think that there are going to be significant changes to the world of television and film post coronavirus? I think that like everyone in this period of rest and reflection, um, I think that there are going to be more stories like, I mean, for sure, this period has been an amazing period for development and thinking. And if you have projects, okay, who can we attach it to? Who can we send to read? Like loads of scripts were sent out to, to actors and directors to read. Um, I feel that there's obviously going to be a shift in tone. I feel like there's, there's going to be a difference in the type of stories that are going to be told. Um, I think as people reflect on their lives, on why they do things, what the world's going to mean, you know, why are we running around like headless chickens? Like, what is, what is our purpose? I feel like people are going to be more interested in exploring that. Um, I'll definitely be interested in doing that. Um, but then again, you know, some people might want to escape like you do, you know, okay, what's next? Okay, COVID, COVID. No, I want something to completely to lock me into so that I can get away from this world. Um, I think that there's so many opportunities. Stories are so important. Um, they're inspirational, they're um, an education. Um, they are entertaining. Um, and I think people always want, want to be, you know, be able to, 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 to jump into that, whatever, whatever their interests are at the time. And um, I think that they're, they're, they're gonna be loads of opportunities. There are loads of platforms. Um, they need stories. Um, it's just that, you know, at the moment there are slight delays. Um, a lot of projects have been pushed back. Um, so those that might have been lined up to produce, to, to go into production towards the end of this year probably won't happen until early next year. Um, but then again, everyone's been waiting. So it's going to probably be very busy next year, which is again, yeah. loads of opportunities for many people.
Yeah, I'm sure I'm just excited. Yeah. Um, but I'm going to just ask one more question about that. But just in the meantime, if everyone could just uh, start writing any questions that they have um, in the Q&A box, we'll start reading them out in a second. But our final question is, you've already given us a few recommendations, but um, do you have any television or f uh, film recommendations to fill our lockdown summers? Oh God, I hope I don't embarrass myself again. Um, okay, so I watched The Eddie, Damien Chazelle show on Netflix, I really loved. Now the Mark Ruffalo show, that I, the, the Derek Sam Franks one is, um, I, I knew something, just Google Mark Ruffalo. Yeah, I'm sure you can find it. Please help me, save me, save me. Um, that is brilliant. Um, what else? Michaela Cole's show is very good. Um, new show, oh goodness, it's called, oh man, I, help me, somebody help me. Um, the Mark Ruffalo one is called I Know This Much Is True. Very good. And Michaela Coles is I... Oh, 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 I May Destroy You. I May Destroy You, that's oh, it. I really want to watch that. That's really good. Um, th those, those are good. What, what films have I been watching? Um, another show, what do I binge? What am I binge? I'm binging on the Heist series, the Spanish Heist series. It is called Heist, isn't it? Is it called the heist or heist? Um, that's been fun. Um, and I wanted to go back to some of the classics. So I want to watch Citizen Kane. I'll probably go back to Mildred Pierce. Um, I'm a big fan of um, Alfred Hitchcock. Vertigo is one of my favorite films. Um, and I can watch that. I mean, like there's been days in the past where I've been quite low and I'll just get into bed and watch Vertigo. Um, Psycho still scares the hell out of me. Still, I don't think that will ever change. Um, other film, other shows, other shows. God, again, there's been so many. Um, yeah, I'll have to think on that. What I've actually been doing again, which I don't always get the time to do, is just loads of readings of, of, of novels um, and books. So that's, I think that's gotten in the way of a lot of the watching at the moment. Um, so I'll probably get back. <laughs> get back on the TV, the shows um, soon. I mean, that's not a bad thing. <laughs> <We're> <laughs> um, yeah. Our first question is from Dami and he has recently watched um, the film you produced called The Earth Belongs to No One and he wants to know oh. what was your wow. experience like during the making of that project? Um, it was a bit challenging actually. It was, um, it was my grad film um, it was challenging, um, but also very enjoyable. We shot that on the, we shot that in Yorkshire in some stunning scenery. Um, and with some, with some great actors, we had Jessica Barden before she started to blow, um, which she was a pleasure to work with. Um, you know, and I got, I got to work with some people that I got to know for quite, well, for quite a while. Um, at film school, some very talented filmmakers. Um, but it was, it, was, it was grad film. So it was like, you know, these, this was the film that everyone come, come to see during our NFTS showcase, you know. And at the showcase, so many people, not that you're thinking it of the time, but you want to make sure that you leave the film school making something quite brilliant, right? Mm -hmm. um, so there was pressure on to make that. Um, but goodness, I mean, how did you get to see that? I don't even know where it's, where it's available. <laughs> we'll find out in a minute <laughs> uh, we've got a great question here from an anonymous attendee who asks uh, do you ever feel like the barriers between work and personal life become blurred when you're creating projects that feel so close to home and revealing most definitely um, you know the thing about this career is it actually yeah when is when do you make professional time when do you make home time it kind of just merges into one and if you're working by yourself for yourself you're working kind of constantly but because it's a hobby it doesn't feel like work but you need to know when to cut off and say okay now i'm going to put that down i'm just going to do my own time and do something else whether it's just listening to music and zoning out and that happens quite a bit um it can be a bit challenging but it's weird because it's not like any profession. I actually love this, like it's, it's a passion. So it doesn't feel like, it really doesn't feel like work. So 
if I'm sitting there and lying down when I'm zoning out listening to music, I'm thinking, okay, well, how can I tell this story and make it engaging? How I'm just thinking about the ways I can draw from life experience to make it feel so people connect, can connect to it. So they're watching it. They're thinking, wow, yeah, yeah, I feel that. I get it. I, yeah. And cause I always, I always get excited when I'm watching something and they've got the detail and the nuances just right. Mm-hmm. I get really excited by that. Like I get hairs standing up. And so I'm, I'm hoping that my work, you know, eventually as well, you know, not only what I've done, but eventually will, will make people will feel that way, you know? So yeah, it is difficult, but you know, if you're passionate about something, it's just the way it is. Yeah. It's good advice. Um, we have a very specific question here um, from someone anonymous and they asked, I have my first feature script written. How do I go about finding a producer? Um, yeah, okay. You'd probably, probably best to go to the BFI. Um, they have like the BFI network or BAFTA. They are, they have specific departments where you can find crew and people to attach yourself to. The other way you can do it is if you watch people's films and you like what they do, you can contact them. You know, I'm, I've always been quite ballsy like with things like that. I, you know, if there's someone who I want to meet, I will find their contact and I'll get in touch with them. And look, if it's a good script and they like you, you might, you, you might surprise yourself. Don't think that it's not possible because anything's possible and you must try. And, you know, even if your, your script isn't perfect initially, but the, the, the producer, whoever you approach, sees something in you, they would quite happily nurture you and take it. I've done that many times where I've seen talent, but talent needs to be nurtured. Like my talent would need to be nurtured. So, and people are there to support you on that journey. I'd say approach those people and see if they can help you along the way. Um, you know, I went to film school, so I met a lot of producers, but that didn't stop me from, um, or, you know, other, other filmmakers, other, other disciplines, but it didn't stop me from building relationships with other producers um, and, and other directors. So yeah, I said BFI, BAFTA, there are some other networks you can go to. Like, I think there's something called Soul, um, um the bfi runs that get in touch God, what's his name um this is terrible sorry guys i'm forgetting names and things it's really bad um but my brain is just like kind of filled but bfi check with those guys the bfi is amazing resource for 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 connecting to talent i hope that's helpful that's really helpful thank you um and Dami has just, just because this relates to your answer just then, he asks, um, do you think that going to film school is a must for filmmakers and or actors? No. I went there purely because I was 31. I had come from a career already and I was like, look, I need a fast track to meet the connections and to learn. And I went to film school because I knew it had a reputation. Um, and it's crazy, but there is associations, people that, oh, you get to that school. Okay, well, we'll open the door for you. You have to still work, but I'll open the door for you because I know you went to that establishment. Um, you don't have to. I think if you're determined and you want to make something of yourself, you, you will make it of yourself. You'll find the people, you know, it's like, I, um, I, there are some people that didn't go to private school, but in the end, later on at university, you make the same people. So it's, it's, it's really, it really depends on you. You don't have to, but it is an amazing experience to be submerged into an environment where people, um, you know, sleep, think, breathe, film. It was a great experience. Mm. Um, our next question. And you can get bursaries. Sorry, you can get bursaries and you can get scholarships, okay? I got scholarships. I got bursaries. Um, don't think about where the money's coming from. Apply and then think about the scholarships. There's ways. So don't think it's impossible. Just wanted to say that. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, our next question says, how do you bring your friends and the important people in your life along with you on your career and projects? Well, you've got to be my friend, right? <laughs> no. Um, how do I bring... Um, if, if they are interested yeah. and they are passionate, then yeah, they can come. They can... We can... If we... Um, 
I don't know. It's like if you're if you're interested and you, you're dedicated and we come up together, we can. I mean, a lot of people I went to film school with, we are still very tight. We're in a tight network and we help each other. But I've seen their passion. I've seen their dedication. If I just grew up with you and you think that because I'm in this business, I'm just going to break you in. It doesn't work like that. You really have to show something, you know, because you have to. I can't I can't be pulling you in and then you know, opening doors for you and like pushing you through the door and then you're just embarrassing me, you know. So, yeah, I mean, I do. I bring people up for sure, you know. Um, and I also nurture people. I mentor people. I give talks in film schools. I'll happily go into primary schools and tell primary school kids that they can become filmmakers. I will, I will do that. And I've always said that if, if, um, if I go to give these talks and whoever comes to talk to me, if they strike a relationship with me um, and I can help them, bring them in, I'll bring them in for sure. But you have to show me, because I've, I've worked hard, you have to show me that you can work hard um, and that you're ready to do what you need to do to just get up there, you know? Because it, it can be challenging. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, thank you so much for that. I think our last question um, is again from an anonymous attendee who asks, uh, do you always have a clear vision right from the start? Or do you feel like, or do you find the so story or the vision changes vastly during the process of producing and creating? Um, I think you have a vision, but it does change sometimes. Um, yeah, it's, it's like when you're writing something, you go in with an idea, you have the essence of what that is. But as you're crafting the story, things can change in a way that you might not expect it to. And it kind of has a life of its own. Um, it can feel like that when you're developing a script, but you have an idea of exactly what you're trying to do, but it can, it can adapt and change for sure. Yeah, so be open to the adapting and the changing because sometimes that it's actually better than the original idea that you think it, you know, that you already had in your mind or you thought it would be. So, yeah. Perfect. Well, I think that is all we have time for. Um, but thank you so, so, so much for all of your amazing answers and for just giving us your time. Um, and thank you everyone who joined the call and asked such brilliant questions. We're really grateful. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> thank you so much again. And to everyone else, please like our Facebook page for more updates and register for our next Q&A with director Maria Kate Audley tomorrow, Thursday, July the 2nd at 7pm. And thank you again. Thank you for giving us your time. We really oh, pleasure. It. Pleasure. Thanks for everyone joining. <laughs> I can't see you, but thank you. <laughs>